Luke 22, 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. The religious leaders of that day sought how they might kill the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion presumes to worship God, but they sought to kill the one alone who is to be worshipped. Let's pray together. Our gracious Father, thank you for your many, many blessings upon this family and upon each one of us. Thank you for bringing us together this morning. What a, what a privilege and what an honor. And how you've impressed upon us here recently. How blessed we are that you've brought this family together here in this place and that you've brought your gospel to us and that you meet with us. How gracious you are to meet with us. Bless your gospel this morning, Lord, to our hearts. Feed us, comfort your people, and cause us to glory in you alone. In Christ's precious name we ask. Amen. Think how beautifully God arranged this scene here. Two things converged together at one time. The Passover drew nigh, and that corresponded in time with this fact. The religious Jews sought to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the Passover? What happened to the Passover? Verse 7, look at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. That's what the Passover was. It was something to be killed. And they plotted to kill the Passover at the time of the Passover by God's beautiful arrangement. I've heard it said that to thoroughly address a subject, and I think this is good, somebody said this, to thoroughly address any subject, you should tell your listeners what you're going to say. Then say it, and then tell them what you said. <laughs> That's a good way to preach. Well, here's what I'm going to say. Here's what I'm going to say. Christ is the Passover. We don't observe a Passover day or feast because Christ is our Passover. Colossians 2.8, if you'd like to turn there. Colossians 2.8 Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Think about what he's talking about here. He's saying beware all of this but for a reason. Philosophy, that's the wisdom that man can come up with. Philosophy is man trying to figure out what is and why. What's true and why. Beware of that. Man can't, can't answer that. In vain deceit. Some might use the scriptures, but how are they using them? Are they saying what God said, or are they deceiving people? After the tradition of men, that's, that's normal in religion. That's just, that's just traditional, to deceive people. Isn't that right? 
after the rudiments of the world. And here's the problem with all of that. It's not Christ. There's just one problem with all of that. There's one problem with everything that man comes up with and believes and trusts. It's not him. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in a body, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we don't observe a Passover because Christ is our Passover, keeping God's Passover. Before we begin reading in Exodus 12, which you know we're going to do, because if we're talking about the Passover, we need to know what the Passover is. But before, and that's in Exodus 12, if you want to kind of turn over there, we'll look at verses 1 through 13. But remember how that God sent the plagues upon Egypt. And you remember why. God came down to this earth and presented himself in the form of a flaming bush that was not consumed. And he spoke to Moses from that flame. But uh, you remember what he said to Moses essentially is, I've come down here, I've heard the cry of my children, and I've come down to save them. That's the gospel. That's the gospel throughout all the ages of this world. There are some sinners that cry out to God for mercy. And God has mercy on sinners. He delights to show mercy. And they cry out to him because of his mercy, not as a, not, uh, not the other way around. But uh, remember how that God sent the plagues upon the land. He sent Moses to tell Pharaoh. The first time that God spoke to Moses through Pharaoh, what was the message? Do you remember? Let my people go. And Egypt and Pharaoh represent this world and the bondage that men are in by nature. There were generations now. The, the, the children of Israel had been born into bondage for years, from hundreds of years. And that's a picture of us. We're born into bondage. We're slaves of the day we're born, slaves to sin and self and Satan and everything, every enemy. But God said, my people are coming out one way or the other. He didn't say it, and that's me paraphrasing, but that's what he said. And he said to Pharaoh, you let him go. You let him go. So the purpose of God in all of this is what? Simple. The salvation of his people. When you see that word Passover, that's what it's about. You remember where the Lord said, when your children ask you what all this is, you're going to observe this from now on. We don't observe the Passover exactly the way they did because they killed a lamb and our lamb has already been slain for us. The lamb of God that takes away sin. But we look to him and we worship him the same. And we observe the table which pictures him and his precious body and his shed blood. And he said, when your children ask you, what, what's all this about? Tell them it's the Lord's Passover. And he's not saying just say that because their next question is going to be, what's the Passover, right? He's saying, explain to them what this is. This is how God saves sinners. That's what it is. Well, how does he do that? Let's look at it. Let my people go. It's about the deliverance of God's elect from bondage. It clearly pictures the salvation of all of his elect in every kindred, tribe, nation, and tongue under heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ said to the religious Jews in John 8, 28, listen, he said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and he that sent me is with me, and the Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And as he spake these words, many believed on him. Many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. I've said this to you before. Are you saved? Do I, do I, think, I think old D down here might just be a believer. 
but I don't know for sure. But ask me again 10 years from now, and I'll tell you. And then, you know what I'm going to tell you then? Ask them in another 10 years. <laughs> if you continue, if you fall away, look like Judas was one too, didn't it? Looked like it. He was a gospel preacher. Sure looked like it, but he didn't continue. But look at what he said. Listen to what he said now. If you continue in my word, then you're truly my disciples. A disciple, it's today that counts, doesn't it? Do you believe on him today? Do you believe on the Son of God? Not have you believed on him or are you going to believe on him? Do you believe on him? He said this, and you'll know the truth. And the truth will make you free. That's what we're talking about. Freedom. Freedom from bondage. From generational born into bondage. The truth, And they said, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, you shall be made free? And Jesus answered them, verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. You're a slave and you don't even know it. You're born into bondage. And you remember we talked about Egypt before. He made them, he, Pharaoh forced the, the people of God to make bricks without anything to make them out of. They complained, you know, and he said, well, you're gonna, we're, I'm not even going to give you any straw to make bricks, and you make bricks. That's the bondage of the law. You've got to please God, but you can't please God. You can't, ple- you can't measure up to God's law. God's law says make bricks. Where are you going to get the straw from? You don't have any. You can't make that. What a picture of our situation. It's hopeless, isn't it? It's hopeless, helpless bondage. But he said, you're, you're a slave to, your, to yourself, and you don't even know it. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son does. The son abideth forever, and if the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. That's what we need. We need the son of God to make us free. You're not going to earn your freedom. Pharaoh's never going to be satisfied with you. He's never going to be done with you. God's going to have to bring you out of there. And how does he do it? By the blood of a lamb. What a strange way (laughs) to win a victory. What a glorious way. So the Passover has to do with God saving his people from bondage, from slavery to sin. How's he going to do that? You remember that God told Moses early on now, and think about this. It's not God trying his best. You know, he, he, some people might look at that, and I've seen it portrayed, you know, that God's trying to say, you know, he's sending the plague. He's sending this plague. That didn't work. But God's going to keep on trying. He told Moses from the start, he's not going to let you go. Not going to happen until when that blood is shed and the blood is put on the door and the lamb is eaten. And I see that blood. Get your walking shoes on and and your walking stick ready. (laughs) You're going home. The water was turned into blood and the frogs covered everything and flies. Boy, that one really, I can't stand a nasty fly. And they were covered everything. They couldn't sleep. And all of that, the hail, the giant hail that just crushed everything. I tell you this, if God wants to do you in, you're fixing to be done in, aren't you? But then God said, he said, he said I'm going to harden his heart. He's not going to let you go. But I'm going to send one final plague. And he's going to let you go then. And that's what happened. Salvation is according to God's will, and it cannot be thwarted. The Passover is that final plague. It's freedom. If it's the sun making you free, that's what our text is about this morning. So look at uh, Exodus 11. Look, well, let me, yeah, look at Exodus 11. You're, if you're at, at chapter 12, it's nothing just to turn back to chapter 11. And let's look a little bit at that. Verse 4. Moses said, Thus saith the Lord about midnight, Will I go into the midst of, e- of Egypt, And all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die 
from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even unto the firstborn of the maid servant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of beasts, and there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be like it any more. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue. Not only are you not going to die from that plague of the firstborn, it's not going to touch your house, but nothing else is either. Nothing, there, you're not even going to have an accident or get in some kind of trouble. Not a dog shall move his tongue against man or beast. And here's why. Because the truth of the matter is, when religion says God is trying to save everybody and he's done all he can do and now that it's up to you, the truth of the matter is it's just the opposite of that. That God has made a difference between you and everybody else. Isn't that a glorious truth? <laughs> That's why God does things the way he does, so that you'll know that. Do you know that? Maybe you're wondering, am I one of his then? You know how you find that out? You come to him and say, Lord, if you will, you can have mercy on me. You're a savior that can save whoever he wants to. And if you want to, I'll be saved. That's how you come. Save the sinner's prayer. You don't need that. It's got to come from right here, doesn't it? Throw that thing away and cry out to God from your heart. God, have mercy. I'm a wretch. I'm hopeless. I'm helpless without you. I'm sinful and evil and vile. But if you want to have mercy on me, you can. And I sure do need your mercy. <laughs> well, so look at verse uh, at, 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 at uh, uh, chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 12, verse 1. This is what our Lord, this is what it's talking about. The feast of the Passover was nigh. And they sought to kill him. Who? The Passover. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. Now we know that every single sinner, it's between them and God now, and you've got to have a lamb. But in this, during this time, the, the father was priest over the household, and so he was representative of all of the house. And also only the firstborn was killed, but that's a picture of everybody in that house now. Everybody in that house. God wasn't done with the world yet, so he didn't kill all everybody. That's what we all deserve. But you see the representation here. For every house, a lamb. There wasn't a lamb killed by every single person. But for every family and for every one by representation. In other words, if your father killed a lamb for your family, then there was a lamb killed for you. You see that here? It was killed for you. The father acting as priest for that family, just as the high priest later would kill a lamb for all on the Day of Atonement for all of the land of Israel, picturing God's spiritual elect. But here it was the father, and it was for each family. And the point is this. Everybody needs a lamb and he must be slain for them everybody everyone in the matter of the salvation of a sinner now this is personal it's between the sinner and God every individual person must have a lamb slain for them Christ Jesus was not just slain for mankind in general he was slain for you if you're his this is my blood which is shed for mankind? No. He said, I, this is my blood which is shed for you. He was slain for you. If you're not one of his, then he was not slain for you. 
Think about that for a second. Egypt is the world. And the Jews picture the elect of God from every nation. When those lambs were slain, were any of those lambs slain for an Egyptian? Was there a single lamb slain that night for an Egyptian? Not according to God's word, there wasn't. And so what was, and what was the difference? Do you suppose God could have told everybody? Let's, let's talk hypothetically for a second. Our Lord did that sometimes, didn't he? He spoke hypothetically. He said, if this would have happened, then this would have happened. So think about this for a second. Do you suppose that God could have told everybody in Egypt that night, if you kill a lamb, you'll be saved? Egyptian or Jew, doesn't matter. Anybody that kills a lamb will be saved. Now, you think he could have done that? Could God have arranged it where one lamb was slain for everybody in the place? And whoever prayed maybe for salvation by that lamb or whoever walked an aisle somewhere or something and said, I want to be saved, would have been saved. He could have arranged it that way if that's the way it was, if that's how sinners were saved, but it's not that way. It's not, it doesn't happen like that. God makes a difference between people. And the difference is the lamb. And this is very simple, isn't it? Very simple. There was death in every house that night. On Passover night, there was death in every house. In the houses of the Egyptians, a sinner died. Picturing all sinners and what we deserve by nature from God. In the houses of the Israelites, a lamb died instead. In the stead of a sinner. Picturing clearly our Lord Jesus Christ and how God saves sinners by his precious blood. Now, either you will die forever because you richly deserve it, or you will not die forever in spite of the fact that you richly deserve it. And the difference is the lamb. If Christ died for you, then you will live forever. He that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And that's true for every sinner that believes on Christ. Now look at verse 4. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So how many members of your family was taken into account and how much they could eat was taken into account. Were they not? Did you see both of those in there? You know why? No leftovers. <laughs> no leftovers now. And this goes with verse 10 where he said later there, you're not to have any of it left to the next day now. Eat all of it. Eat all of it. Why'd he say that? Now think about this. The lamb should be shared if necessary with another household by smaller households if, so that none of it would go uneaten. And there's a couple of beautiful truths in that. It's all, it's only Christ, all Christ, always Christ in all of his glory, in all of his attributes, in all of his truth. That saves sinners. But also, listen to this. There was no lamb. There was no lamb for anybody that wasn't going to eat it that night. There was no available lamb. There was only eaten lamb. Now think about that now. There was no, and there wasn't any, I don't like lamb. You know, your kids start saying, I don't like that. You know, and you end up having, have any of you ever cooked three different suppers? <laughs> there wasn't none of that. All the lamb was eaten. Think of the simple truth here. All of the lamb was eaten and everybody who was one of God's own ate lamb. Listen to what the Lord said about that. In John 6, 53, Then Jesus saith unto them, Except ye, verily, verily, I say unto you, verily, verily, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. 
This is a spiritual book. Don't try to make something strange or weird or disgusting out of that and call it religion. You've got to partake of God's Passover by faith, by faith in the Son of God. And his flesh and his blood are mentioned separately because that's Christ and him crucified. It's his person and what he did. It's, people talk about Jesus, 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 this, believe on Jesus. What Jesus? And they talk about somebody dying on the cross, but who was it that died on the cross? You see why it's got to be his body and his blood. It's got to be who he is and what he did. Who he is made what he did what it was. And what he did, being who he is, was save his people. Which is what all of this is about, as we've already seen. He redeemed them with his precious blood. I never did turn back to Exodus 12 because I had that part in my notes, but this next part I don't. So let me get over there. And I want you to look at verses 43 through 46 in Exodus 12. Exodus 12, 43. And the Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. There shall no stranger eat thereof. There ain't no leftover lamp. The Egyptians couldn't come over and say, You know, we're, we've been hearing about this. We won't, you know. No, his people ate all of it. There's no available lamp. There's none available. No stranger can eat of it. They're not invited. <laughs> Well, Chris, aren't we supposed to preach the gospel to everybody? Of course we are. I'm not God. I don't know who's going to eat and who's not going to eat, but he does. He does now. And the Lord said unto Moses, this is the ordinance of the Passover, there shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and an hired servant shall not eat thereof. Now, if you're just a hired servant, if you're just kind of on rent, you not you don't get any lamb. If you're bought, you can eat. <laughs> you see the gospel in all this? You're bought. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh it brought out of the house except in the case where he said before, you're sharing the lamb, neither shall you break a bone thereof. That's a clear one too, isn't it? Not a bone shall be broken. That was normal for them to break the legs of those hanging on the cross because they would have hung there for days and days and days and suffered, and they let that go on for a while. Now, they wanted them to suffer, but at some point, and of course, you know, because they had their religious holiday coming up, they were breaking, they were going ahead and ending it because you supported yourself with your legs on the cross, and that's how you were able to breathe. Our Lord Jesus had already given up his spirit, committed his spirit to the Father long before they came around. To, to break legs. And all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. All the congregation of Israel. So you see, it was specific. It was distinguishing. Christ, the Lamb of God, slain for God's spiritual elect, is not available to everybody. He didn't die to make salvation available. He died to save somebody, and he did. Is that simple enough? That's the difference between the, the truth and false gospel now. It's a vital difference. No leftovers. He was slain for a specific people. He's partaken of by faith by all of those people. Every one of them. That's what it pictures there. All that the Father giveth may shall come to me. Every one of his elect are going to partake of the Lamb. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And as I've said before to, to you, anybody that has a problem with that, boy, you know, election excludes people. No, election includes people. Your sin is what excludes you. <laughs> if you have a problem with God choosing some, why don't you just come to him for mercy? He said, I won't cast you out, didn't he? 
You know why you won't? Because you can't stand him. <laughs> well, verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. In its prime. <laughs> you shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Hmm. I've, I've recently, my daughters have some goats of the first year in their yard right now. There ain't nothing cuter than that. <laughs> Boy, I'd hate to kill something like that, wouldn't you? Hmm. You shall take it out. The most beautiful one. The most precious one with no blemish or spot, healthy and vital and strong. You can't just come to a Jesus now. You've got to come to the Holy Lamb of God, that holy thing that shall be born of Mary is the Son of God, and there ain't but one. There's just one Lamb that has no blemish in whose mouth was found no guile. And there's only one lamb that takes away sin. John said, Behold, the lamb. The lamb. The spotless lamb of God went to Calvary and made his own precious, sinless soul an offering for the sins of his people. The spotless lamb died on Calvary. It had to be the lamb without blemish. A sinner can't pay for the sins of a sinner. Only the spotless lamb can redeem his people. Only his blood is precious enough to pay for our sins. He said this, it says this in 1 Peter 3.18, that Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just. There's a reason it says the lamb must be without blemish because that identifies who he is. He's God Almighty in human flesh. They kept saying about him, only God can do that. That's right. He's God Almighty walking around in a body. The fullness of the Godhead in a body. And that's the one that's got to offer his soul for our sins on Calvary. He suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Don't be confused about that. That he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. And you remember what I just read a minute ago? All that the father giveth me shall come to me. You know why? Because he died, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. <laughs> That's why we're coming. Because he brings us. The spotless Lamb of God rose from the dead, death having no claim upon him. Why? Because he's the spotless Lamb. What about our sin? He put him away. <laughs> having put my sin away forever and having none of his own, the sin of all those for whom he died is put away. And I love those words in the text that we just read, verse 5. Your lamb. Your lamb. It doesn't say the lamb. I like that, don't you? Fade, fade each earthly joy. Jesus is mine. It is enough that Jesus died. And that he died for me. Bless God, his holy, spotless, precious lamb is my lamb. Verse 6, and you shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Can you imagine that? Everybody that was going to have partake of that lamb on Passover night they killed it all at the same time in the evening of that 14th day remember verse 7 now the next verse of our text of, uh, 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 not, not of this passage but in our text verse 7 of our text in Luke 21 
22, the Passover, what's, what's got to happen to it? It's got to be killed, and it? Got to be killed. It must be killed. Jesus in the manger doesn't save, does he? <laughs> no, as precious as he was then, God's precious lamb then, wasn't he? Simeon said, I've seen your salvation, looking at the little baby. Jesus just on the Mount of Transfiguration in his holiness shining forth in the glory of his person. As glorious as he must have been to behold there as he shined. So bright. He didn't save us there. What he spoke of there on that Mount of Transfiguration was what? With Moses and Elijah, the death that he should accomplish. That's how he saved us. The Passover must be killed. We preach Christ crucified. That's that's vital. That's vital now. The Passover must be killed. Listen to Paul, Acts 17, 2. Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. If you're going to open the Word of God and, and reason with sinners from this book, what are you going to say? That Christ must needs have suffered. The Passover must be killed. And risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus whom I preach unto you. Is Christ. Is Christ. If God's going to be glorified in all of his attributes. Think of all of the attributes of God. And how Calvary. How God shines forth in all of his glory from that. No wonder the Lord Jesus said there in John 17. Father glorify now. This is the hour. Glorify thy son that thy son may also glorify thee. His justice. If God would kill his own son. As he bore our sin there. Then God must punish sin. He's just and holy. His mercy. His grace, His love, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. If sinners are going to be saved, redeemed, accepted of God, then Christ must needs have suffered. That's what we say when we open this book. That's what Paul said. In verse 7, And they shall take of the blood... And strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. The blood of the lamb signifies the death of the lamb. When you see that blood, you know something. somebody died. An innocent victim was slain. It must be killed. And that blood is the, is what, is the symbol of that. By putting it on the door, as God instructed, they were saying by faith. If there's going to be mercy for me, if there's going to be freedom for me, It's going to be by this blood. By grace are you saved. And that's what we see. God made a difference, didn't he? That's grace. But by grace are you saved through, put it on the door. (laughs) Through faith. Through faith. God gives you grace, he'll give you faith, won't he? They were saying by faith the only way that God is not going to kill me is if his holy lamb has died in my place. That's again what the publican cried. God be propitious to me, the sinner. In other words, don't kill the sinner. Propitiation has to do with bloodshed, the offering, the sacrifice. And we're partaking of the lamb. Notice it said in the house that you eat of, you put the blood on the door. You're eating it. You're You're partaking of the lamb. You're presenting the lamb. And we're trusting the lamb. The lamb is for us. It's, it, it, the lamb is in us. The lamb, the lamb, it was all about the lamb. It still is. It still is in verse 8. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire. When I said roast with fire, I think it made me, it made me realize, it made me think about how hot it was. I don't mean to joke about this, though. Think about what we're talking about. I'm sorry about that. 
They shall eat of it, eat of it not raw, nor sodden at all with water. It's just roasted lamb, isn't it? Roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof. And you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. There's so much teaching in this. The pertinence thereof was the innards. You know, in, in, in many countries, they, don't, they eat everything, don't they? We wouldn't do that here. You know, we wouldn't eat that stuff here. But that's kind of how it is in religion, isn't it? There's parts of Christ that, boy, yeah, he's, he's going to take care of me and, you know, make me prosper. And he's going to take me to heaven when I die. You know, there's parts that people rejoice in. You start talking about who he is now. And as we refer to verse 10 before, let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which of it, that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. There's none of, there is no available lamb. There's just the lamb slain and eaten. That's, that's key to this now. Roast with fire because Christ bore the wrath of God. For sin, fire from heaven in the place of his elect. He said, listen, in Lamentations 1.12, you'll recognize this part. It's no, is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. And this is the Lord Jesus Christ bearing our sins in his body. I don't even know what that means to you, but here's a little something about it. From above hath he sent fire into my bones, and it prevaileth against them. That's what this Passover represents. Unleavened bread, because all through Scripture, unleavened bread pictures sinlessness. It's undefiled. A little bit of leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. That's talking about sin. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Listen to what Paul said about that. He said, your glorying is not good. Remember that word glorying. You boasting in yourself is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Your glorying is the leaven. It's sin. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory. Save in the lamb, slain, roasted. That's why it was eaten with unleavened bread. And listen to what he said next. Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as ye are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And you've got to eat the lamb with unleavened bread. No glorying in the flesh. No glorying in works. Anything that I've done or am or haven't done or ever will do or not do. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Love for him according to his word. Bitter herbs. It's eaten with bitter herbs because though we rejoice in his atonement and salvation by his redeeming blood, what could be greater cause for rejoicing? And yet we mourn. Because it's my sin. It's my sin he paid for there. And don't eat it raw. It's got to be Christ roasted with the fierce wrath of God Almighty. Nor boiled. A reminder that it is to be roasted with fire. There's no substitute for the substitute. There's nothing that replaces him. There's no, and it's Christ crucified. It's Christ bearing the God's holy wrath. The whole point of all of this is the deliverance of God's people from bondage. And the only way God can be just and justify a sinner is by Christ suffering all of the wrath of God against their sin. Verse 11, and thus shall you eat it. With your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. 
<laughs> I love that verse, don't you? We are, we're fixing to walk free from 400 years of bondage because of this lamb that we're having for supper today. <laughs> There's only one way to eat that, to partake of him. The reason for our freedom, deliverance from every enemy, mostly ourselves, our own sinful wretchedness. And the only reason for our freedom is the lamb that we're partaking of right now. I'm eating, partaking of Christ himself through the preaching of his gospel this morning. And you know how I'm doing it? I've got my traveling shoes on. How about you? <laughs> got to, got, how else are you going to eat? That's why we eat. That's, and that's faith too, isn't it? That's faith. Got your walking stick in your hand this morning, don't you? God-given, saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We partake of him and we're girded up. We're ready to go. Are you ready? Bless God, I'm ready. We're fixing to go home. And he said, eat it in a hurry. Eat it in a hurry. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day. Uh, I, I, I can't get over the fact. It don't even say today is the day. It says now is the day. There's nothing more urgent now. I know we've got we've got our lives to live and all that, do you? Got your life to live? I hope that God has taught us a little bit better these last several weeks what's needful, what's necessary. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Boy, there's a lot in that too. We could just we could preach a message on every verse of this and not even come close. All the gods of Egypt. The gods of Egypt were just wood and stone. I don't believe that's what he's talking about. Do you? By nature, sinners consider themselves gods. Isn't that what Satan said? You shall be as gods. God's wrath is on all the gods of this world. Every sinner without Christ, every false god, everybody and everything apart from Christ. You remember what we read a while ago? Beware of everything that's not Christ. Beware of philosophy and deceit and vanity. It's not Christ. That's what he said, wasn't it? Everything apart from Christ and those in him is and are under the wrath and judgment of God Almighty. Hebrews 10, 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much more sore punishment of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Verse 13, The blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, <laughs> I will pass over you. Salvation involves us, obviously. He said, this is my blood, I shed it for you. 
And it's by grace through faith that we partake of of Christ. Faith that he gives us, but faith that it's, it's my faith. My faith have found a resting place. But listen, salvation is something that happened between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. It was done for me by God. When I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. It's interesting. It doesn't say I will bless you. When I see the blood, I will bless you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. It, it says it in the negative sense. I won't kill you. <laughs> Believers are the exception, aren't they? Except ye repent. You're all going to perish. All of us. Except. We're the remnant, the leftovers. <laughs> Just a couple of things about this and we'll close. It shall be a token. Token means sign. But here's the next part of the definition. If you look up that word token in the original Greek, in the original Hebrew, it'll say a sign, comma, a distinguishing mark. We read a while ago where God said that he was going to do things the way he did that you may know that God doth put a difference. The point of all of this is God saving his people. That's what we've seen. But here's what God wants you to know about that. The reason you're saved is because he made a difference. Hmm. And that word difference there, where he said, I put a difference between Egypt and my people now. That word difference means marked out, separated, distinguished. The Lord did that. I made a difference, he said. I made a difference. I, I marked you out. I separated you. I distinguished you from everybody else. They didn't distinguish themselves by anything they were or did. And that's what this verse is. The reason I'm bringing that up now that's what this verse is saying when I see the blood. Not anything you are or did or will do or anything about you. They did not distinguish themselves by anything that they were or did. The Lord made a distinction. He did not say, I see what you did there and I'm going to pass over you. He didn't say, when I see your heart. Well, the Lord knows my heart. Yeah, he sure does. That's the problem. He sure does. People usually don't say it that way, though, do they? they? What they usually mean by that is the Lord knows I have good intentions, you know. No, he knows better than that. He didn't say when I see that you've decided to do what I told you to do. <laughs> that, this is religion. He didn't say when I see you putting the blood on the door. He didn't say when I see you eating the lamb. And that's important. It's important to distinguish that, isn't it? Because that's what is being preached. When I see the blood, the difference is God's lamb slain in my place. It doesn't even say when you see the blood. I'm glad I see it, aren't you? I'm glad I see it. That's how I sleep at night. That's our comfort, isn't it? But it's not our security. Our security is he sees the blood. Christ crucified is not an offer to sinners. He is and was an offering unto God for sinners. Big difference. The difference between the, the thief. You think about what that Passover represented and you see... God's lamb hanging on that cross on Calvary and there was a thief crucified on either side of him. And one of them died cursing his name. I'm pretty sure it was the one on his left hand. And the one on his right hand died with a promise from the Savior that that very day 
he would be with him in paradise. And the difference between those two thieves and what happened next was the one who hung between them and that precious blood, the blood of God, that stained that cross. No wonder Paul said, God forbid. God, don't let me glory. Your glorying is not good, Paul said. (laughs) That's the leaven. That's the leaven. Eat the Passover with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The truth is the gospel. That's how we partake of the Passover. Just now. By the preaching of the gospel. And God forbid that we glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a blessing to worship with you this morning. We won't have a service tonight and we'll just give the Rona one shot at us today. (laughs) Aren't you glad that God controls every germ? We're not to tempt him. We're not to be fools, are we? but I'm glad he's on the throne. And uh, it's a blessing, a great, great blessing to be with you this morning. Amen. You're dismissed.